And thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate it. You taking your time to talk Thanks with us me. today. Uh, I know that you're really busy, so I appreciate that. So um, I'll go ahead and do your introduction and then we'll go ahead from there. Carolyn okay. Artley is a therapist here in Maryland specializing in anxiety and traumatic stress response. In her practice, she hopes to give clients the tools they need to become their own inner therapist. Today, she aims to provide you with helpful information that might be different from what you are seeing on our regular news and social media. If this interview is helpful to you at all, please contact Caroline. She would love to hear from you. You can reach her at eTherapy Group. Thank you. Caroline, can you just give me an overview of the type of therapy that you practice and what we're going to be going over today and how it's going to be helpful? Yeah, sure. So I do, uh, when I'm working with people for anxiety, stress management, traumatic stress, I do a combination of different types of therapies. What we're going to be talking about today has to do with um, some, some cognitive behavior therapy as well as some brain spotting. So I know you have some non-traditional stress reduction techniques that we've talked about. And I would love mm -hmm. for you to share that with our members and lawyers in Maryland and to help them manage these really difficult times. Yeah, sure. Um, so I have traditional ones too, but I feel like in these non-traditional times, it might be helpful to have a few extra tools in your belt. Um, I'm hoping to give you some of Stress Therapy 101 as well as 201. Um, 101 is more uh, what to do for yourself when stress is impacting your ability to carry out your um, regular, your day. And 201 is what to do when that stuff's not working. So um, to start, I'd like to give you a couple of simple exercises if that's okay. Hopefully these aren't ones that you've seen before. And um, the first technique that we're going to use is a virgin's technique. And basically um, it just means that you're gonna, you're going to look at your finger and then you're gonna look in the distance so your finger becomes blurry. Then you're gonna look at your finger and in the distance again, and look at your finger in the distance again. You do this um, back and forth for about 20 seconds to a minute or so. And the reason that this is effective is because um, there's an oculocardiac reflex that goes from the eye to the heart. It's a really efficient way to send a signal from what we see to uh, to our, our fight flight response. So basically it, it says, uh, it's an incredibly fast signal. It's very efficient. It says danger appro approaching, pump hard, just in time for our legs to kick in our, or our arms to start fighting. Um, so the results of actually doing this virgins exercise is a decreased heart rate. And the reason that's important is because in anxiety and in stress, we tend to the floater. We tend to have a higher heart rate. We tend to feel pressure in our chest. And so doing this little exercise, um, alternating from near to far every two or four seconds or so, and then for about 20 seconds long to a minute. I mean, you can do this sitting at your desk. You can do this uh, stirring the pot in the kitchen. You can do this sitting at a red light in traffic, and it takes about a minute. And that's a way to um, calm down your heart. Um, yeah. So, and then the second exercise is what I'm calling a blizzard principle. So for anybody who has lived somewhere other than Maryland that gets a lot more snow than we get, um, I've heard that there's that expression, shovel early, shovel often, all right? Shovel early, shovel often, yeah. And, um, and so I think these are exercises that we should all be doing early and often in our day in this pandemic. Um, the first one is, um, it, it's, it's a concept of a vagal refresh. The vagus nerve, it connects the brain to all of our major organ systems. It's responsible for that, like, will I live or will I die um, response. It, it, tells, it tells all the systems how to keep us alive, maintain homeostasis. And it's really working overload these days. Um, so we want to give it a chance to refresh. And one of the ways we can do this is, um, again, with eye movement. The first one was an eye movement by looking near and looking far. And then this one is a different one. So actually, if you just look all the way to one side, and then you hold it there until you either naturally swallow or yawn. I'm going to swallow probably because I'm talking, but you wouldn't be talking when you're doing this. You just look and you hold it until you naturally swallow or yawn, and then you look the other direction. 
and you hold that until you swallow or a yawn. Um, Lisa, I didn't tell you I was going to ask you any questions, but I'm curious, do you know why we're looking for a swallow or a yawn in um, a, a need to move from fight, flight to rest, digest? No, I, um, well, I know that sighing or yawning can be a release. And yeah, for the nervous system. And I'll have to say I did try this on my own. And I found that I was yawning when I was doing it. And it was very, it was actually very relaxing. So I'm yeah. thinking that it, it has some physiological effect on the body. Yeah, so the vagus nerve, uh, part of it is fight flight, the other part is rest digest. And so we're really in this heightened state of alertness, which is going to, it's not going to move us necessarily all of us into fight flight all the time. Some people are going to be there, but we're still in that heightened state of alertness. So to refresh it, let's move it over to a little rest and digest. And so a swallow means digest and a yawn means rest. So when we when we feel that in ourselves, then we know we've given the nerve that refresh. And I think that's something that we should all I mean, it takes how long did it take you? To, Not very to, long. To yawn? Not very long. Seconds, right? Not minutes. Yeah, it's really easy. You can do it sitting at your desk. You can do it if you're driving to work or to the store. You can do it sitting at a red light. It's just really easy to do. You can make a game of it and do it with your kids and just see if they can if they can make themselves yawn or um, or or swallow naturally. And um, and then everybody can be getting that refresh. So if I um, just clarify, um, you do it, you do it on one side and then you do it on the other. Sure. And yep. my thought is that you're working both sides of your brain. Is that why you're kind of that that part i don't really know i don't know if it's as effective if you only do one side or the other i don't know i just know that it's it's a refresh of the nerve and it makes me feel a little bit more relaxed yeah, it definitely does okay so another great way to refresh the vagus nerve is just by taking a cleansing breath now a lot of new clients when they come to me and i talk about breath work they're like, no, I've tried it before. It doesn't work for me. I'm just not going to do it. It's not going to work for me. And so what I say is, I mean, my clients are the experts on themselves. I'm not. I'm brand new to their lives. Um, so if, if they tell me that breathing, doing breath work doesn't work for them, then I believe them. So I want people to only focus then on not necessarily a technique, like how long they're holding their breath or um, what they're counting or saying when they're doing it. Just focus on what it feels like when you naturally sigh, when you just kind of <sighs> sigh and um, and try to emulate that because that's your that's your body's actual natural way of shifting information from one place in the brain to where it can be processed and like really like put away, put away to what needs to stay and what needs to go. And so that sigh does that for you. And um, so I think between like looking two ways and uh and doing that sigh that's probably um enough it's stuff we can do all day every day and it's it's um it's it's enough to keep refreshing our vagus nerve i think that's a great way to that. um it, there are new techniques that i have not heard of before in that sense i do know i have a lot of clients who don't like to take do deep breathing because they go internal instead yeah. of uh, external any type of grounding techniques that you um have that can be yeah. helpful to somebody who really has a hard time taking that deep breath. Yeah, perfect. That's what I would have done for um, 201 because you're right. I mean, some people really do. They go inside themselves and when they take those breaths or when they do this exercise, they find that they're not feeling better and then they start to worry. Oh no, what does this mean? Does this mean I'm never gonna actually get calm? And that's not really it. Um, if a calming strategy ever makes you feel more worked up, it's probably a sign that that will I live or will I die signal, it's already kind of concluding that it looks like the latter um, or it's very close to that conclusion. So you can let it know that you are in fact still alive by feeling the ground, wiggling your toes. Um, if, you, if you can, grab a drink of water, nice cold water. Um, see what you can find within your senses. So as a revisit to kindergarten, your senses are sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. And um, just name the things that you can find with those senses. Um, and um, actually, one thing that um, has actually been very potent is smelling citrus. Actually, in my work with healthcare professionals right now, I'm suggesting to them that they get um, an air freshener in their car 
that is citrus smell so that they start and end their shift with that really strong grounding, bringing you into a presence, into the, into the here and now smell. Um, and that way they can kind of anchor their shift with that, with that um, smell. And I don't think it's a bad idea for all of us to be doing. I mean, you can eat an orange at lunch. Um, you can have a citrus diffuser. It's, it's a, for whatever reason, that smell is potent enough to remind our bodies and our brains that we are still alive, we're still functioning and to try to keep us online. And when we do those exercises, then we're usually able to get a better response from the stuff we talked about in 101. That's great, those are really good techniques. Does anybody ever feel funny about doing the eye movement or they don't quite understand it or a little apprehensive about it? Yeah, so, um, I will say that that was actually, I had a lot of resistance to that in the very beginning too. Um, and it, it really, to be honest, it, it wasn't until I saw results in my clients that I started talking about it, about it and sharing. I just kind of thought, let's experiment with some of this stuff. And people were telling me that it was really effective. So um, I found out it reflects a lot of the latest neuroscience refresh. Uh, sorry, it, refle it reflects a lot of the neuroscience research um, what the finding is that where you look affects how you feel. And the reason for that is that the optic nerve travels to a region in the brain that's responsible for interpreting and processing our sensory information, as well as where we are in space and time. Um, during traumatic stress, the concepts of both space, where we are in space and time get confused. Right now, trauma experts are wor warning all of us right now that COVID um, is poised to impact um, these concepts in all of us, regardless of prior experience with anxiety or traumatic stress. It's, it's um, going to impact all of our senses of time and space simply because the places that we're accustomed to go to aren't available to us anymore. Um, our brains give us the desire to go to comfortable places, you know, like a house of worship or a family's home or uh, have a barbecue with friends. And our brains can get confused about why are we not doing these things at a time when we really need them. And um, many people are reporting a distorted sense of time. Um, I've heard people say, I, I've heard this a lot actually last week. So it, it, there's something about it coming up in the last week or two uh, among our, our um, pandemic timeline. People feel like they're living Groundhog Day. Um, and I've also seen, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a meme going around that says something like April is the longest month of the year with like 420 some days in it or something like that. Yeah, it's felt like that. Um, so our, our sense of time is getting really distorted. And these um, eye movements are um, because of the location of the optic nerve traveling to that part of the brain, the superior colliculus, it somehow is sending a signal to help process that information. And then I would think if you do have any trauma in your history, this time is gonna be even harder for you. Um, yeah, so um, if you have any trauma in your history, then yeah, this is going to be a, a little bit harder for you. So Carolyn, can we talk a little bit about fear and uncertainty during these times? Yeah. Sure. Give us a little information about that, some things that might be helpful. Nowadays, we keep hearing how, I mean, it goes without saying, right? We've never lived in a pandemic before. We've never had these kinds of shutdowns before. We've never been so isolated before. Um, and so that uncertainty, it tends to make people fear. It tends to make us think that because we don't know what is coming, that there must be a reason to fear it. And, um, and I'm not here to say, like, uh, to, to make a, a, a decision about how, how dangerous it is out there with the virus or how busy our healthcare systems are or how, how the virus is contracted. That's not what I'm here to say. I'm just, uh, my, my, um, my work is mental health, right? And so I know that when we come from a place of fear, we're not efficient, we're not effective, we're not able to put our best constructive thinking forward. Um, it's, it, it takes us really kind of out of ourselves um, and it makes us hard to relate to the people around us. It makes it hard for us to do our jobs. Um, and nowadays we're doing our jobs around our families or our household members, and it just makes it really hard to mingle all of that. So 
Um, so, so really what my observation has been is that the more afraid people are, um, the less they're able to get done. Do you just want to touch on that the techniques that we use can help that too, because that can help to help calm down, you know, if you're an anxiety. Yeah, that's fear. a really good idea. So one of the things that we do in brain spotting is again, coming from the principle that where you look affects how you feel. We find an eye position that's related to how we're feeling. So for example, if a person is feeling fearful, then we ask them, where does that fear land in their body? And um, I'm just gonna give an example. Um, you know, maybe it, it lands in their gut. They, they, they feel uh, something in their gut that's fearful. Then we ask them to find an eye position that's associated with that feeling in their gut, makes them feel closer to that fear in their gut or makes that feeling grow. And um, we can do that by just looking uh, to the right, to the center and to the left. And they can usually figure out where that position is. Um, and it could be higher or lower, but they can usually find that position. And just by holding your eyes in that position and focusing on what you feel in your body and whatever comes up from that, that gives, it's kind of like telling the eyes, kind of tell the brain to shine a spotlight on that area in the brain that's holding that fear so that the brain now knows that it can process it out. And by process it, we really just mean figure out what to keep and figure out what to get rid of. And um, what you keep is usually the, the good stuff, um, the part that makes you not hypervigilant, but vigilant, you know? And um, what it gets rid of is usually the hypervigilance or um, that feeling in your gut or that fear, fear of uncertainty um, so that you can be more um, constructive and pragmatic about how you approach things. If somebody wanted to pursue this a little bit more and they wanted to work with someone who does brain spotting, right. That's something that you do, but I know that it's not something that a lot of people do. I don't think there's a lot of people in Maryland. How would they go about finding I, someone? So there's about 20 other people in Maryland. And fortunately, nowadays, it's not a matter of how close they are to your work or your home because it's all online. So um, you can find that on the BrainSpotting International website and you just search. You're going to need to find somebody who's licensed in Maryland. Um, Maybe your lawyers know that, that, that we can't practice across state lines. I don't know. But, um, but yeah, so they'll, they can go to that website and find somebody who's licensed in Maryland, who's trained. And quite honestly, it does not even matter. I mean, we all have on that website how many different levels of training we've been through. But from the moment somebody comes out of the level one training, they're already able to walk you exactly through that exercise. And that's a really good question, Lisa, because some people are able to do this completely on their own. We call it self-spotting and some people aren't. And I'm one of the people who's not able to find this spot completely on my own. And there's a relational component to this as well, um, which is really fascinating, but we are biologically attuned to one another and we are designed and built to heal within community. So it really is helpful to have somebody who understands this process that can help guide you through it and um, and help you clear out what's in there, be it fear, uncertainty. It could be it could be many things. And um, nowadays, too, if if you've had um, this is a time when all of our prior stresses are coming out. So it's like um, anything that we've ever been worried about in the past, we've been stressed about in the past, any time that we've ever faced our mortality or a major sickness, or um, really, I don't wanna put labels on anything because anything that's ever been stressful for us in the past is going to kind of start looking around and asking if this is a time when it needs to be concerned again. And so even if um, some people, you know, would say that they're not feeling stressed out about the virus, they're not worried about contracting it or about their loved ones, they're feeling pretty safe, but they're still feeling a heightened set of alert, sense of alert, and anxiety, it's most often, it's something else that was just, you know, still stored in the brain somewhere, in the body somewhere. And this exercise um, can help to clear that out for you. That makes sense. I think people can be triggered on a lot of different levels, depending on what's going on and what their history has been. But I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us and giving us this information. Yeah, thanks for having me, Lisa. Appreciate it.